It's December 23rd, which means that in two days, Wonder Woman 1984 will premiere on streaming service HBO Max while simultaneously opening in theaters. An important precedent, as Wonder Brothers' entire slate of 2021 movies is set to release concurrently in theaters and to streaming. This was perhaps inevitable. As the coronavirus rages on and movie theaters in particular remain a dangerous space, it's to be expected that studios would look for a new venue to release their product. But as someone who loves the cinema-going experience, it's hard not to be anxious about what this means for the future of movie theaters. The convenience of streaming is hard to argue with after all, and once general audiences get a taste of new movies premiering in their homes, who's to say they'll want to go back even when it is safe? Then again, maybe the collective cabin fever from spending the last year quarantining will remind us all how much we love movie theaters in the first place. Whatever the case, I'm not here to preach doom about the end of cinema, nor to decry the evils of streaming. Instead, I want to talk about how the inconvenience of theaters, namely that you actually need to leave your home to see a movie, can be a wonderful thing. And to do that, I need to talk about the first time I saw The Irishman. I'm lucky enough to live in a city with a thriving independent theater. Anyone who lives in Kingston will likely be quick to sing the praises of the screening room, not only for its dedication to art house and foreign language cinema, but for more generally being a space that celebrates film going and film history. And as much as I've always loved the theater and the people who run it, I've never been more grateful to the screening room than last year when they played The Irishman. I love you. I just love you. Come here. I love you. I can't hear. Scorsese's latest gangster epic was, of course, a Netflix production, and the streaming giant could not come to agreeable terms with several theater chains, with companies like Cineplex and AMC refusing to exhibit the film outright. Thankfully, the good people at the screening room had my back, and I was able to experience The Irishman as Marty no doubt intended. And it's a good thing, too. Any Scorsese movie is an event, but seeing the man return to the gangster genre with so many of his core collaborators seemed too good to be true. More simply, much as it's easy to reserve the big screen for grandiose spectacle, I believe it's the more introspective, character-driven movies that really thrive theatrically. Don't get me wrong, I love me some good bombast, but nothing beats cutting out all distractions and losing yourself in the screen of a really great story. And I certainly lost myself in The Irishman, sitting mesmerized for three and a half hours as Scorsese made what feels like his final word on the gangster movie. Watching the film wasn't as fun as Goodfellas or as exuberant as Casino. It lacked the defiant energy of Mean Streets or the quotable dialogue of The Departed. In their place, a mournful story of loss and regret, one where a lifetime of sin comes to bear in the twilight of life. In this sense, Frank Sheeran is much closer to Jake LaMotta than he is Jimmy Conway, or Sam Rothstein. Though death and the passage of time haunt the Irishman from its opening frames, however, the full weight of the story only becomes apparent in the film's final act, as Frank becomes increasingly isolated and empty, with little left to do with his remaining days but wait out the clock. The concluding scene is a remarkably simple one. A priest leaves Frank telling him he'll be back after the Christmas holidays. Frank asks if he can leave the door open, as he doesn't like it closed all the way. And then, we linger with Frank by himself, waiting with uncertainty, utterly and completely alone. I cannot overstate how hard this ending hit me. As subtle as the performances and the framing might be here, the result is a devastating embodiment of a man completely alone at the end of his life. These are the images that accompanied me as I left the theater for my long walk home. Now I'm usually the kind of person who puts in headphones the second I step outside, but this felt different. Instead of immediately reaching for the sonic release of heavy metal, I kept my headphones in my pocket as I walked up the street and spent some time reflecting on what I'd just seen. It was abundantly clear that The Irishman was something special, one of my favorite films of the year in a year that was full of movies I loved. I also thought about how the film fit within the rest of Martin Scorsese's filmography, not just the gangster movies I mentioned earlier, but his most recent output. 
One of the things that's been so exciting about Scorsese's late period work is not just that it's been largely great, but that his movies don't feel like movies made by an old man. Whether it be his experimentation with 3D technology, or the sheer ferocity and attitude of The Wolf of Wall Street, Scorsese feels as energized in his 70s as he did when he started in the 1970s. And I guess the same is true of The Irishman. The film's experimentation with digital de-aging effects, the most ambitious and extensive application of the technology yet. But in its subject matter, its pacing, and its themes, The Irishman shows Scorsese's age in the best possible way. Walking past bars and restaurants, I dwelled on the haunting meta-quality in Scorsese, himself an old master in the twilight of his career, asking so bluntly what a life amounts to as it comes to an end. There's shades of the seventh seal in how uncompromisingly the Irishman foregrounds the anxieties we take with us to the grave. I thought a lot about Once Upon a Time in America, too. Sergio Leone's final word on cinema and a movie Scorsese seems in direct conversation with. If that film was a grotesque portrait of the gangster's monstrosity, The Irishman is more elegiac, making no excuses for its heroes, but still watching them go with a deep sadness. And amidst these heavy thoughts, there was a lot of joy swimming through my brain too. The fact that Joe Pesci had come out of retirement to deliver arguably the best performance of his career, Al Pacino's delivery of You dumb motherfuckers! You know what you did? Oh, I love this whole scene. You're giving it to him! I'm going to jail. You have the statement. And the sheer thrill in simply seeing all these guys making a movie together again. And not just on camera, but behind the scenes too. Seeing the names of so many vital Scorsese collaborators in the credits filled my heart with joy. And for as much as the film marked a reunion of old pros, I also thought a lot about the younger cast. Stephen Graham, Bobby Cannavale, and Anna Paquin. So much digital ink spilled over her lack of dialogue, in so many ways the soul of the whole movie. And then there's Robert De Niro an actor who's made some very questionable decisions over the last 20 years, returning to his greatest collaborator. In the months that would follow, De Niro's performance would be overlooked by awards bodies, who flocked to Pesci and Pacino. But on that walk home, I was convinced I'd seen some of the best acting of my life. What kept rattling in my head was the voiceover, and how the matter-of-fact confidence Frank speaks with throughout the film becomes so shaky and anxious towards the end. But more than anything, I kept going back to that final shot, and the feelings of loneliness it left me with. The image also struck me as such a distinct contrast to how Scorsese introduced De Niro in their first film together. Our first glimpse of Johnny Boy in Mean Streets is blowing up a mailbox, but the real introduction is in a bar, as Johnny struts in slow motion, a girl under each arm, as Jumpin' Jack Flash bursts through the soundtrack. Watch it. It is, in a word, fucking sweet. I can't think of a better cinematic depiction of youthful arrogance, one so vibrant in a love for both life and the movies. This was not the first feature film for either De Niro or Scorsese, but to watch this scene is akin to watching both men being born on celluloid. And to see that transform into the fear and vulnerability of the Irishman's closing seconds made for a strange mix of emotions. A certain sadness, no doubt, but also an enormous love and admiration. There's something really poetic in seeing how far the two men had come together. As bizarre as it might sound, that long walk home was almost as important to me as the movie itself. Champions of the theatrical experience often point to the communal side of things, sharing a work of art with a room full of strangers, and I love that too. The collective laughter in the climax of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, or gasps at the midpoint turn of Parasite, were some of the best movie moments I've had in recent memory. But I also think there's value in the solitary aspects of the cinema, that the supposed inconvenience of going to and from the theater can provide a zen-like bliss. Having to actually walk home from The Irishman and be alone with my thoughts allowed me to really grapple with what I had just experienced, why it mattered to me and to reckon with the feelings it had stirred. Simply put, it gave me time to think. And you're not given that time, when Netflix shoves more content in your face the second the movie's over. <laughs>